Good morning. Good morning. We're glad that you're here this morning. Um, we're gonna we're gonna get started pretty quick. I'm gonna pray for us and turn it right over uh, to Mr. Robert Barnes. Uh, we're excited and glad that he came uh, this morning. And so I'm looking forward to what he has to say to us and the message. He always has something that not only challenges uh, you, hopefully, but it always challenges me. And so I appreciate him coming to open up the word and to be able to challenge us. And so let me pray for us as we get started. Father God, we thank you for today. God, we pray uh, for these students. God, we just ask you to fill them up with strength and with courage and with uh, the desire to seek after you. God, we pray for this morning as Roger comes and shares a message. God, I pray that um, our hearts would be open, uh, that we would hear what, what you are saying through him, and God, that he speaks through. We thank you for all that you do in our life, and God, we pray you continue to guide your us. In Jesus' name, amen. Please welcome Mr. Roger Barnes. All right. Good morning. Good morning. So happy to be here with you this morning. We have an opportunity to look at the scriptures. If you would, if you have a Bible or a tablet or a phone, turn with me to Ruth chapter 2. I'm going to get it on my phone as well. Ruth chapter 2. How's that? Um, is that better? <laughs> Sorry about that. We're going to Ruth chapter 2. And what we're looking at is a series. There's a book. If you want the book, I'll be glad to gift it to you on Amazon. The book is called Against Ruthless Society. Against Ruthless Society. But we're going to Ruth. Chapter 2. Lord God, I pray that you would use this time for your glory and for the good of your people. I pray that you would be pleased to use me to encourage your saints. In Jesus' name, amen. So the last time we were in Ruth, we have someone who is loving when it's not in their best interest. There's nothing in it for Ruth. Y'all remember that? Naomi and her family, you might call them the farewells. They're with you as long as things are going well. But when things were not well in Jerusalem, they leave Jerusalem and they go to Moab, a place that God has said, don't go, don't go to Moab. But every man is doing what is right in his own eyes. And so this is what looks right to them. This is their truth, right? And they go there. And eventually, all the men of the home are gone. And so you have Naomi, and all she has left are these two daughters-in-law from Moab, Ruth and Orpah. Y'all remember that? And on her way back, she says, there's nothing in it for you. If I got on Plenty of Fish tonight and met somebody, anybody know what Plenty of Fish is? See, y'all shouldn't know anything about that. That's scary right there. I'm picking on she said, if I met somebody tonight, could see tonight, had a child tonight, are you going to wait for that child to grow up to have a husband? She said, there's nothing in this for you to go back. And really, her way of thinking is canonized. Her way of thinking is very worldly. I do something for you, you do something for me. There's nothing in it, this idea of sacrifice, of living, even when it's not in my best interest so as to help you. Does that make sense? And Ruth says, you don't tell me to leave you. And she makes these commitments to her. She says, where you go, I go. Where you live, I live. Your people shall be my people. Your God, my God. Where you die, I die. And let nothing separate us. So she goes, I'm not getting anywhere with this young lady. And so she goes. And they come back to Jerusalem. The women recognize them. And Naomi, if you read the story, she says, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, which means bitterness. She said, I went out full. I had a husband. I had two kids. 
I had everything, and I have come back with nothing because the hand of the Almighty is against me. She is dead. And there's Ruth right there. In my biblical imagination, I just say, see Ruth's sin. So what am I, a chop liver? I'm, I, I stay with you. And it's okay. To be a real friend sometimes is to be with someone when they don't appreciate you. Does that make sense? It's to be a real friend when there's nothing in it for you. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friend. They done Jesus said that the great, 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 great grandson of Ruth. Well, now we're in chapter two. Ruth went back to Naomi, and we're in chapter two, verse one. There was a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth, of the family of Elimelech. He's related to Naomi's husband. His name was Boaz, which literally means in him is strength. So Ruth, the Moabitess, said to Naomi, please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him in whose sight I may find favor. She knows the Hebrew scriptures so well. She knows that God has provided for the poor in the scriptures. If you have a field and there's a corner of the field, God said, I don't want you to gather all the grapes or all the wheat out of even the corner of the field. I don't want you to glean it. You're going to leave that in the corner for the poor. Does that make sense? And she says, let me go glean in the field. Because I know something about your culture. She's not a Jew. She's not a Hebrew. She knows enough about their culture and their word to realize that God has provided for her. She says, let me go and glean. And she said to her, go, my daughter. Then she left verse 3 and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. What it actually says in Hebrew is that she chanced, chanced upon this field of Elimelech. Or another way of saying it in Hebrew is her luck got lucky. Even her luck was lucky. It's not luck though, is it, right? The sovereign hand of God is directing her as she lays down her life to serve somebody else when there's nothing in it for her. Does that, y'all see that? The sovereign hand of God is guiding and directing her steps that if you would get up to do God's will, God will make sure you have everything you need to do it. Amen? Amen. You know, I'm, I'm trying to wrap the message up, Clint, but I mean, they're not saying amen. I, you know, it may make the message take longer. Amen? Amen. If you would get up to do God's will, God will make sure that you have everything you need to be a true friend. Well, now Boaz, verse 4, came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. As we introduce this man, Boaz, whose name means in him is strength, the first thing that we hear out of his mouth is the Lord be with you. And the impression we get is that he's a godly man. He's actually a mighty man of valor. That's the best way of translating where it says a man of great wealth. It's actually better translated or translated in other places, a mighty man of valor. Well, he says, the Lord be with you. And they answered him, the Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant, who was in charge of the reapers, who's in that whole business? He's very astute. He came to this field that is being reaped, and he greets everybody, but he didn't miss the young lady over there. He saw her. He noticed her. So the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered and said, it is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. It's well known. You know, it's the young Moabite woman. Notice that she is not referred to by her name. She's referred to by her ethnicity. The black guy, the white guy, the Hispanic guy. She, in that sense, has lost her identity. And it's not important what her real name is. All you need to know is that she's one of them. 
She's not one of us. She's the Moabite. That's how he describes her. And she said to her son, please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and has continued from morning until now. Though she rested a little in the house, she has been working hard. After they would gather the sheaves, she would follow behind them and she would gather. They would gather a little more and she's right behind them and she's gathering. And she's doing all of this so that she can take care of her mother-in-law. And Boaz said to Ruth, you will listen, my daughter, will you not? Why does he call her my daughter? Anybody? I mean, she's not literally his daughter. Anybody? Why you call her my daughter? Nobody wants to try? Okay, she's related to Naomi. That's good. What's your name? Elaine? Lily. 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 All right, that's good. She's related. So she's a relation. That maybe that's one reason. Yes. What do you got? Okay, so you think he sees family relation in there, and that's why he says, my daughter. These are good. As you are reading the scriptures, you should ask questions and prayerfully try to answer them. Anyone else? He's God. He was God. He's not God. Boy, he's not God. That's, <laughs> she's so much younger than him. It is not uncommon for a man in speaking with a much younger man to say son, even if he's not a son, right? Look, son. And it is not uncommon in this culture for a man as he is speaking to a woman who is much younger than him to refer to her in a way that is kind and say, daughter. And he says, you will listen, my daughter, will you not? I mean, you'll listen. Do not go to glean in another field. Don't go from here, but stay close by my young women. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap and go after them. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. He says, I don't want you scavenging. I don't want you going from field to field. Stay in my field. Not only are you going to be provided for, he says, but you're going to be protected. I've already told my young men Y'all don't touch that young man. I've already commanded them. You are not only provided for, but you are protected if you stay in this. This dude is awesome. This Boaz in him is strength. So she fell on her face, bowed down to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? You're unlike anybody else I've interacted with. To everybody else, I'm just a Moabite. People often will not even make eye contact with me. They treat me as an ethnic and national foreigner. I am reduced to something that is less than what I really am, which is a Mago Day. Why are you treating me differently? His kindness was so uncanny, and she had been treated with disdain for so long that now she is overcome with emotion because somebody had the audacity to show love and kindness to her. Y'all see that? That's what it says there. She fell on her face, and she's asking what's going on. And Boaz answered and said to her, It has been fully reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband and how you have left your father and your mother in the land of your birth and have come to a people whom you did not know before. The Lord repay your work and a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come for refuge. You left everything, you even left your gods and you have come under my God. You know what he said? He said, girl, I'm being nice to you. Check it out because you're fine. I'm not talking about her dimensions. He said, girl, you're fine. He's talking about her character. He said, girl, you look good to me. Because of the way he treated Naomi, when there was nothing in it to do. You're overwhelmed with emotion. He's overwhelmed by her beauty. You're beautiful. 
Then she said, let me find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your maidservants. Verse 14, now Boaz said to her at mealtime, come here and eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed parched grain to her and she ate and was satisfied and kept some back. We're going to close up right here. We're going to wrap up right here. He not only protected her, he not only provided for her, but you need to see that he promoted her. She was outside and he brought her inside. See, a meal is something intimate, right? We're sitting eating our chicken McNuggets. You with me, man? We're eating our chicken McNuggets. It's fellowship if I invite you to join us. It's real fellowship if I invite you to dip your chicken McNugget in the sauce with us. Especially if I let you double dip. You bite it in the mouth. I'm like, man, what you doing? You can't do it. I'm like, it's all good, man. And what he did is he brought her into their fellowship in a way that would have been outlandish. He let her drink from the water that they drank from, and he let her eat from the food that they ate from. In fact, he says later on, I want you to let some of the food fall on purpose. And I want you to let her drink from the water that you drink. I'm like, what? Her lips going to be on the thing there. I just hear Boaz saying, did I stutter? What does it mean, men? And I'm speaking especially to the men right now. To be a man in whom there is strength. It means you use that strength. You use your position. You use your prosperity. Especially for the women who are around you and the poor. You protect them. You provide and you promote. Amen? Amen. That's what it looks like to be a man in whom there is strength. You protect, you provide, and you promote. Lord God, thank you for this time. My prayer is that you would be stirring up in these young people what it means to be real friends like Ruth, to be able to be real heroes like Boaz. Lord Jesus, all these things that are intimated are perfect in you. You are the real friend. You laid down your life for your enemies. And you have brought us into the family of God. And to those who believed in him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Thank you, O Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you, Robert. You know, in a, in, in a world where we live, where we, more often than anything else, care about what we get out of something, it's refreshing to be challenged about a story about a love that's beyond what I get out of it, but it's a love for the people and the person. And the challenge for you guys is to love people for who they are, not for what you might get out of the circumstance or situation. Okay, as you go about today, as you live your life, I want you to really love people. You know, as, uh, if you are interested at all, I, I'd encourage you to, to talk to, to Pastor Barnes about Getting that book, Against Ruthless Society. It goes on. I'm sure, I haven't read the whole book, but I'm sure that it, that it will go on and it will be very applicable to today. You know, in a, in a world where we are so consumed with self and self-promotion. What does it look like? What would it look like if a generation of people rose up and said, you know what? That's not the way it should be. I'm not going to promote myself over everybody else just because that's what everybody does. But I'm going to start loving the people around me in a way that lifts them up and encourages them. And how much different would our world be? So that's my challenge for you guys today, for this week, for the rest of your life. To look around and love the people around you more than you love just the stuff you get. Uh, before we go, uh, Mr. Wiegand? No? Nope. Okay. All right. Let me, let me uh, I guess that's it. Seniors and faculty, y'all are dismissed.